who was eyewitness to many of the changes and thank you recorded many of the changes and can share that with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening everyone. Um, this is a very bad room and there's no clock and I haven't got a watch. <laughs> so you will be here quite a long time. Um, I'm relying on Jane to, to keep me to time. Um, you'll notice I've, I've subtly changed the title from Forgotten because I'm sure there are people here who haven't forgotten Sinbad to Lost because it is as lost as the Grey Friars and the Black Friars, extraordinarily. And, and archaeologists now are sort of unearthing of archaeological re remnants of this 19th century suburb. So it is archaeology, but there are a lot of uh, records and images and a lot of memories of, of, of old St. Ebbs. Um, there were two views of, of St. Ebbs. Um, and this is a picture of um, Albert Street um, from the corner of Albion Place on, on the right. <laughs> looking down towards Speedwell Street in the late 60s, just about opposite um, Cambridge Terrace. And it shows the area in decline just before the, the wreckers moved in. And I've got a couple of quotes um, from people with opposing viewpoints about the area. First comes from Hal Cheatham in his Portrait of Oxford, published in 1971. St. Ebbs has been too long a dirty, down at heel slum, and the only ones who regret the passing are the sentimentalists who have never had the doubtful privilege of living there. So that was the, the opposition, and they were, it was an numerous opposition. Then there was a former resident, R.A. Russell, writing from Saxon Way in the 1960s to the Oxford Mail. I, along with thousands of others, happened to have been born in that slum, and had the area been planned and not destroyed, you could have had a beautiful heart to the city, filled with city folk. So that's the, the two opposing views. Um, in the talk tonight, I want to look at how this suburb came into being. Um, flourishing is perhaps a, a difficult word to say for it, <coughs> how it, it existed for something like 150 years, and then vanished, and a bit about um, St. Ebbs today. So there'll be five sections. Um, first of all, the sort of background to the 19th century development. Um, how the development happened will be the second bit. Something about the character of the suburb will be part three. Um, then the various improvements that were carried out and the sort of move to clearance, which took an incredibly long time. And then finally, this look at uh, St. Ebbs that we have today, um, changing literally by the day. So if we move on back into the past, I'm not taking you back into, into the friars and all the rest, I'm leaving that to the other speakers in this series. I'd like to take you back into the 18th century. Um, this is Isaac Taylor's map of Oxford in <coughs> 1751. And it shows how the area of the Friars and Thebes had changed since the um, clearance of the religious houses in the 16th century, leaving just sort of the few fragments that we see today. Um, and not a lot else, really. Uh, much of the area had been given over to Market Gardens, the Paradise Garden, and down by um, St. Paul Dates, there was a big uh, market garden also. You'll notice on the map um, remains of the trenches. Um, these don't seem to tie in with any of the other um, Civil War defences that are, that are shown on de Gaulle's map and, and in other mapping. Um, but maybe there were different uh, Civil War defences down here. But by and large it had just lapsed into uh, meadowland owned by a series of private individuals. It was interesting that it didn't belong to a college or colleges, um, unlike <laughs> St. Thomas's, um, the other side of the Castle Mill Stream, hidden behind this um, shield here. Um, all that was, was Christchurch land, which Christchurch had inherited from, from Osney Abbey. Um, the Friars area uh, became very much a sort of freehold um, set up 
and uh, that was significant uh, come the 19th century. You'll notice from this map how the area was interlaced with uh, little streams. Um, we've got the Castle Mill stream coming down here, which is very much still open, obvious. Um, Trill Mill stream was then still an open stream running down around the back of Christchurch and emerging uh, east of Folly Bridge. But you also had another significant stream here, and then a back stream running down the um, west side of, of St. Aldate's. Um, which provided water for a brewery, which must have been rather nastily polluted at times. But uh, so there were all these interesting streams, and, and one of my big regrets for the area, I think, is the way Oxford has just got rid of all these these wonderful streams, which could have made St. Ed's so much nicer today. So that was Taylor. Um, this is Richard Davis's map of Oxfordshire. Um, surveyed 1793 um, it's 1793-4, it covers the entire county but it's a very good plan of the city and here we see um, how things have progressed in, in uh, St. Ed's. Not a lot, but at least in 1751 you've still got the Paradise Gardens and you've got a much more established area of market gardening um, south of the Trill Mill Stream running right down to the uh, what's now, or what we, what's called the Shire Lake uh, stream there. <coughs> you still see the remains of the trenches, which I guess he's just <coughs> inherited from Taylor. Um, the Tan Yard is an obvious site again. Um, that had been in the area since the 16th century. Um, it's interesting for the development of St. Ed's because a guy called Alderman Thomas, Alderman Thomas Bricknell um, acquired the Tan Yard and all this sort of meadowland behind. And it's his sort of financial fortunes or misfortunes which sort of lead to the development of St. Ed's in the 1820s. So we have this sort of wonderful area of, of uh, meadowland, market gardens with sort of fantastic views out across um, the Thames down into to, and, and to Berkshire and down to uh, Hinksy Hill and, and so on. Uh, one or two people in the 18th century were taking advantage of that. And there's this lovely surviving house, um, Clark's House in Clark's Row, um, closer to um, St. Aldate's, which has miraculously survived all the vicissitudes of the last couple of centuries. Um, it's seen its view go. Um, it's seen the houses that block the view go to be replaced by the ghastly Speedwell House. Um, but it's still there and still looking rather fine and listed and so close to uh, Tom Tower. One of the crucial things about St. Debs, of course, is how convenient it was. Um, it may not have been um, totally wonderful, but it was incredibly convenient for, for people living there. So you did have a few people um, setting off um, to, to build smart houses out overlooking this, this uh, meadowland. You also had some quite significant survivals. Um, this is a drawing of what Henry Taunt called the inner gate to the Franciscan friary. Um, Taunt, the photographer, was born in St. Ebbs. His whole um, sort of family history really is part of the, the history of St. Ebbs. And he was born in 1842 and he drew, drew this picture later in life based on his memory of what this looked like when he was six. <laughs> you know, which I have to sort of recall the things I saw when I was six and have since gone. Um, but this was at the end of what's now Turner Gain Lane again, um, was Charles Street in these days. And then you went through this gateway, which I guess is, is the remains of, of the... Um, of the Franciscan Friary into what had by that time in Taunt's memory become Penson's Gardens and indeed Penson's Gardens is where he was born. So this is a, something that survived into the 19th century into, indeed to the middle of the 19th century. And then there's a building um, which some of you will recognise this has become the Deaf Centre and from this interesting uh, drawing remains of the Blackfriars near Littlegate, you'll recognise that this 
building which en encompasses some of the stonework of the uh, of a gateway into the Blackfriars did amazingly survive and was built around this, this later property, which again, quite extraordinarily, has survived. Um, this is a, another picture by the same artist um, whose initials are RCB. Um, I need to go back to the Bodley and Hughes Index to establish whether they know who RCB was, um, whether he was related to the Bucklers, because um, John and John Chessel Buckler were also busy recording things like this at the time. But this is a you know, sort of real the sentimentalist view of, 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 uh, of old St. Ebbs. This is the bottom end of Little Gate. Um, this is the Trill Mill Stream, just near the Little Gate tan yard. There's this fabulous old rickety bridge which took you over to the um, ex-Blackfriars building, now the Deaf Centre. So every time you go through Albion Place, which is not a most uplifting experience these days. <laughs> Just remember that underneath it was once this sort of junction of Trill Mill Stream and that other ditch uh, crossing St. Ebbs. And that's why it is sort of big space there. It's just purely sort of the survival of those uh, physical, physical features. Um, John Baptist Malcher, uh, the German musician an artist who came to Oxford in the 1750s to be leader of the band at the Hollywell Music Room. He was an inveterate explorer of the sort of back ends of Oxford, which nobody else ever got into. And this is a view of behind the Tanner's Yard in Little, in, off Little Gate in the 1780s. Beautifully picturesque, mm -hmm. probably full of rats and all the rest of it. But it does give you an impression of the sort of pre-development uh, pre St. Ebbs, and, and again here we're in Doctrill <coughs> Mill Stream, possibly that's a privy <laughs> hanging over the street. <coughs> now my last image in this sort of background section is just out, out of this world. Um, this is Castle Mill Stream, and we're looking up towards St. George's Tower, um, the Wareham stream goes off to the left and Castle Mill stream continues up there. Um, one of these structures is still there and is currently being converted into three uh, rather nice flats. Uh, my wife and I saw a great spotted woodpecker <coughs> outside it just the other day. So although the area has changed so hugely, um, this was the brewer's house incidentally, this was where uh, Mr. Hall uh, ran his uh, Swan's Nest Brewery from, and there was a lovely um, gazebo from which he could enjoy the sort of river iron views around mm -hmm. his house. Um, so this picture, uh, drawing by William Crotch, is entitled The Castle Tower of Oxford from Mr. Bricknell's Meadow, and it was uh, drawn in 1809. Um, I saw this thanks to the Sanders website, um, they're, they're, bless them, they put their better images on their website and so although I couldn't afford the £450 they wanted for the original at least I was able to get a, a, a copy um, for this sort of purpose. So Mr Bricknell uh, brings us on to the um, development really because he'd obviously overreached himself, he'd acquired all this land um, he built himself a new house somewhere around the uh, Little Gate Town Yard. And in 1820, um, he begins to sell off his property um, in order to meet his mortgage obligations. Um, the first sale was in uh, August 1820. And uh, this, this took up six acres of the meadowland behind his property in Little Gate and his house and the tan yard. Um, a guy called Charles Day um, of Euston Square in London bought the whole estate and he then employed a local builder, William Fisher, who was incredibly active in all manners of, manner of development at this date. Um, he staked it all out in lots which were sold in uh, December 1820. 49 lots were offered and uh, the result was 
Fry Street, which we see here in the 1960s. Um, the only sort of recognisable feature is Campion Hall uh, there in the background. So we're looking east along Old Friar Street, um, back towards Rose, Rose Place and, and uh, Campion Hall, for those of you who don't remember this, this view. Um, that was the, that made room for something like 97 houses to be built. Uh, by the 1840s in that little bit. Um, but in 1822, um, the rest of his property uh, was sold off in, in 41 lots. And this provided space for Bull Street, um, New Street, and Abbey Place. And this is a, a view of Abbey Place in the 1940s uh, with the corporation um, refuse operative uh, with his little. Um, hand car there that you go around in enormous vehicles in those days. Um, so that made room for quite a few houses in those three streets, um, something like 77, but it also provided space for a huge <coughs> laundry eventually, which some people might remember. Bennett's laundry was tapped against um, that picturesque view of Castle Mill Street that we saw earlier. So. One of the issues with St. Ed's was that there was no control over what people did on the lots they bought. You could, you could cram as many houses on them as you like, or you could use them for whatever noxious purpose you might want to use them for. So, and, and there was no sort of local authority uh, with any control over, over all this, this business. Um, then, uh, Somebody else, uh, William Fisher, had been involved in, in buying land north of uh, Trill Mill Stream and the builder of this is. And he had the land to the west of, of Turnagain Lane laid out in, and sold in lots in 1822. And that's what facilitated the, the building of uh, Penson's Gardens, part of which we see here and uh, Bridge Street, which crossed over into, uh, into um, Brickman's estates. This picture was only taken by Torn, or one of Torn's uh, assistants, because he'd been born in, in the street. And he got, they got a couple of kids to stand outside the very house which uh, he'd been born in. And it, it's an interesting story that, you know, we hear a lot today about the lack of, of affordable housing. And one of the great things about St. Ed's was that it was affordable. Mm -hmm. um, and the people, uh, Taunt's parents were, were sort of classic immigrants into Oxford in the early 19th century. Um, his father was a plumber who came from Bletchington, and his mother was a domestic servant from West Hills in Berkshire. So they come together, they find a, a, a property to rent in this fairly new um, development and uh, they bring up the guy who, who takes you know, really significant mm -hmm. photographs. So, you know, a lot of little stories like that, I'm sure, uh, lost in the, in the history of, of, of St. Ed's. This is a wonderful map which lurks somewhere in the Bodleian, <coughs> I think in the Board of Health um, records after the 1832 cholera epidemic. And it's the wrong way up in, in our terms, in that uh, north is sort of off to, the, off to the left. I could have swung it round, but it, then you wouldn't be able to read what it says. Um, so here we have Paradise Gardens and Mr. Treadwell's Garden. So those are still as they had been in Davis. Um, but you've got inserted all these new uh, estates. You've got Bricknell's uh, Friar Street whizzing all the way down to the end of, uh, of uh, to, to Castle Mill Stream, and then uh, New Street and Abbey Place and Bull Street there. And then you've got um, Fisher's, Penson's Gardens and Bridge Street and uh, Turnagain Lane, where the Preservation Trust um, is now based, it is, it's obviously there, and Wood Street has appeared and Orchard Street. Um, so a lot has happened by, by the early 1830s, and you've also got the Bull Teal Chapel, who, somebody who was a 
a sort of rather way out um, religious um, views. He set up his own chapel where he could expound them at length. And incredibly, that's another of the buildings that, that has survived the test of, of, of time. But you'll notice that there's a lot um, of gaps still. Mr. Hopkins' Wharf, otherwise known as Friars' Wharf, um, is still there. Uh, and there's no housing on it. And then you've got the, the cookery in the nest, the, the gas works, um, which was put in what was at the beginning of St. Holmes, you know, a very remote location. Uh, when the gasworks was established there in 1819. But the gasworks got bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as the century advanced and it spread right across onto the other side of the river eventually. Um, and obviously it was a source of noise and pollution and, uh, and employment, but that's another thing. So that's the situation in the early 1830s. Um, between then and 1850, when you've got another really good map, that by Hogar, you get development on the site of, of Friars Wharf. Um, as the railways advance towards Oxford, uh, traffic on the Thames uh, just fell away. Uh, and so this interesting wharf uh, in what became the, the sort of St. Ebb's housing area was filled in in, in the early 1840s and these two and three storey houses in uh, Friars Wharf were built. Uh, you've only got to look at houses like this to realise how much they would fetch <laughs> in 21st century Oxford. Um, but of course they never got the chance to, to fetch it. Um, they were destroyed in the 60s. The other big change before 1850 was the development of the Paradise Garden. Um, this had been run by a man called Thomas Tagg, and uh, when he died, uh, his son sold the, the site um, to a man called John Chaundy. And uh, Chaundy had it laid out as a rather nice square, um, with a sort of big central area, which could have been you know, really smart, it could have been like a London square. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have ever been quite that um, sumptuously received, and although the houses were built and, and, and occupied, in 1851 there was a, there was a sanitary report which describes the central area as a desert waste. Uh, now the area was, as you can see here from this 1900s photograph, it was occupied. Um, the rector moved into the rectory um, beginning in 1854, and later St. Ebb's School was, was located to the south, which was still here till the 1980s. And the area was sort of luxuriantly planted uh, for the rector's benefit, and, and I suspect probably the, the school kids had to do some of the, the <laughs> manual labor. So that was built between 1838 and 1847. And so by the time of um, Hoggar's map in 1850, you've got very much nearer to the, the sort of entirety of, of the St. Ebb's development. Um, there's Paradise Square, virtually completed the one or two houses on that side still to, to finish. Um, the garden has shrunk here, uh, Treadwell's Garden, Speedwell Street's been laid out, and uh, some of these other streets, um, Cambridge Terrace and so on, are, are now in place. And you see the gasworks is still fairly well confined, but to the west of it and to the southwest of it, there's quite a little area up here around Bridport Street. Uh, one of the fishy names down here, Pike Street and Perch Street and Trout Street. They obviously were keen on their fishing uh, down here. And then over the other side of Castle Mill Stream, this is all familiar to Rocks Pen's recreation ground territory. You'll notice this little island is still quite separate here. So all that was left um, subsequent to 1850 was the development of the Littlegate Tanyard site, which happened uh, in the late 1860s. And some of you will probably remember the Albion on the corner of uh, Fry Street and uh, Albion Place, which long survived most of the rest of the area and was really a very nice building. Um, the one consolation is that Norfolk House, which succeeded it, 
it's actually quite an interesting building itself, so you don't feel quite so fed up as if it was just a car park or something. And over on the left hand side, of course, is the um, Deaf Centre and with its Blackfriars connection and uh, Bolteel's Chapel. This uh, photograph was 1967, as you might guess from the, from the fashion. Um, this is a bit more of, in, in the distance there on the right, that's more of the 1860s um, completion of St. Ems, the, the Little Gate Tanya site. Um, we're looking from Commercial Road um, on the junction of Blackfriars Road. Um, the shop on this corner was Carlo's, um, which many people remember. Um, Carlo Marchetti was, was um, descended from, from Italian immigrants and, and uh, they set up in St. Ames like the Del Nevos, um, selling fish and chips in the winter and ice cream in the summer. <laughs> uh, I'm not quite sure what date they chose to, to swap, um, but they had, they had a terrifically successful business, both, both firms for, for decades um, and, and based originally in St. Ames. Um, Carlo went out to Chipping Norton on his sort of horse-drawn uh, cart um, and, and there's lovely uh, Mont Abbott in his, his, his reminiscences about Emstone talks about the sound of this uh, Italian singing was, was the uh, cue to rush out to buy the uh, um, ice cream or fish and chips. So sadly, um, Carlos ceased in, in, in about 1960 here, and obviously all of this has since been <coughs> gone. But the, the quality of these houses doesn't look at all bad, does it? And, and the ones at the end, you know, late 1860s, were anything but slummy. I mean, they, they were perfectly good houses, really. So by 1876, when you get the first large-scale ordnance survey, um, St. Ebb's Friars District is really um, completed. And, uh, you know, you can see the gas works is, is becoming more of a cuckoo and beginning to kick out some of the uh, inhabitants. Um, but we've got the whole length of the Blackfriars Road and Friars Street and New Street and, and up there. Um, St. Ebb School is now implanted firmly in the desert waste at, at the top. One of the features you'll notice is that there's absolutely no interconnection between Friars Street and Blackfriars Road, two incredibly long streets. Um, the ditch between them um, was, was the boundary, uh, and indeed it was their, the way that their sewage was, was washed away, if that's the right word, um, for the first sort of number of years of the development. Um, the reason why there's no linkage, of course, is that they were developed by different people at different times with no real interest in making those links. And uh, that's where problems occurred. Which moves me on, really, to the character of the suburb. Um, one's always aware that the suburb was, was perceived as unhealthy. In fact, that was one of the main reasons why eventually it went. Um, there were three cholera epidemics in, in the 19th century. Um, in 1832, 17% um, of the cases in Oxford were in St. Ebbs. In 1849, 37.5% um, of the cases were in St. Ebbs. And in 1854, 29.5% of the cases were in St. Ebbs. So it wasn't particularly healthy. Uh, and uh, Henry Ackland, in his memoir on the 1854 epidemic, included this um, plan and elevations of a house in Gas Street, um, you can guess where that led to, um, which had 11 cases of cholera in, in a single three-storey house. Um, but, you know, Ackland was quick to point out there was nothing particularly wrong uh, with these houses. They were quite standard houses. What was wrong with the whole area was the, the absence of, of, of uh, proper water supply and uh, proper provision for drainage. Um, the 
houses relied entirely on the um, Trill Mill stream or other ditches to take away the sewage uh, or on cesspits which were incredibly close to the wells which were their only source of water. Um, so in the early days of St. Ebbs it was a pretty feverish place. Having said that, the, the introduction of main drainage in the 1870s um, meant that all these properties, however um, humble, uh, were linked into the main drains. Um, they might have to share a toilet, and it did have to share toilets with, with other households, but they were no longer um, polluting the ground. And gradually, too, um, they, were, they had city water introduced, again, sometimes a shared supply but uh, wells were, were steadily closed down. Um, you can't ignore the fact, um, in dealing with the character of St. Dabbs, that it was dominated uh, for all of its history, really, by the gas works. Um, this photograph taken in the 60s sort of maybe over-exaggerates over it somehow. This, we're looking down uh, Blackfriars Road, and there's one of these huge uh, Victorian gas holders, which was just across the river until 1968, um, really dominates the area. Um, it had some value apparently because people wanted to gamble. Um, apparently went onto the top of the thing to do their gambling where the police would get them, <laughs> possibly when the tank was rather lower. Um, but anyway, no, I suppose there are ladders up there. Aren't there? But uh, the gas works were a problem. I mean, they were spewing uh, fumes and pollution all over Oxford, but of course um, St. Ebbs got the sort of first uh, choice of the, of the fumes and, and smoke, I guess. Um, but it also provided a lot of work locally, so it, it had advantages. And there were lots of other businesses, um, <coughs> taking this image from Carol Newbiggins uh, changing faces of St. Ebbs, um, Hathaways were licensed horse slaughterers, um, who went on for a long time. I came across the other day a sort of wonderful account of, of them uh, fending people as early as the 1830s by having sort of tubs of entrails on the pavement outside. It doesn't sound terribly <laughs> charming. But again, this was a long-standing business, and there were many others like it. Um, what did I find? Well, obviously a lot of people found employment in Brewing, there are lots of breweries around. Uh, Cooper's Marmalade moved down to St. Thomas's later on. Um, you had Bennett's Laundry, I've mentioned before, uh, where lots of women were, were working. Um, the clothing industry in Oxford was, was important locally. And as I've said before, um, you couldn't be handier for any of the central uh, businesses, shops, uh, working colleges. So. It was always an enormously handy place to live. This is a, a super photograph of Percy Davis um, and his family and a whole host of children. This is at the end of Turnagain Lane, so this is what how Turnagain Lane ought to finish, <laughs> uh, not in a sort of wasteland as it does now. Um, this was taken in about 1906. And uh, Percy and his wife uh, were running this uh, off license at the end of uh, at the end of Turnagain Lane, uh, prior to him setting up a central furnishing depot round the corner in, in St. Ebb Street, which some of the older members of the audience may remember. I think it, the building was still there when I came to Oxford. Um, oh, St. Ebb's was studied with pubs. I mean, I think there were 26, according to Andy Panton, uh, in his Farewell St. Ebb's book. This shows two of them, uh, the Jolly Bargeman, which records, of course, the sort of trade on the Thames, which was still vibrant when St. Ebb's was originally built, and then further on, the Wharf House, which literally was a building on this Hopkins or Friars Wharf, which, uh, when that wharf was filled in, was magically left. And even more magically, it survived all the sort of efforts of highway engineers and, and other wreckers um, to, to destroy it. So it is still there on a rather sort of nasty little corner now. And sadly, no more a pub. It closed in, in 2007. 
but an extra I could give a sort of roll call of pubs in St. Pebs. It, it, it's an, even the names are sort of poignant somehow. But those are two. And the place was full of little shops. Um, this is a wonderful picture of the Bijou stores in, in Commercial <laughs> Road. This was on the corner of, of uh, Friar Street. They seem to have sold everything. Uh, paraffin oil, you could get your banjo, mandolin, or guitar. Um, you could buy rinso. Um, it even these look like um, those sort of dirty postcards you used to get at the seaside. Um, seaside in St. Paul's. But Lion's Tea, absolutely wonderful shop. So uh, there were many little corner shops that, which uh, served a local need. Um, and then, of course, if you had a greater need, um, obviously St. Ebb Street was a much more vibrant place than it is now. And, of course, at the top of it you had Cooper's um, and then all the other the shops in, in, in this area. I'm fascinated by her and her mini dress because um, <laughs> I shouldn't be at my age. It just shows how recently all this has happened, really. You know, this, this is about 1970, uh, and it was all still here, you know, but uh, no more. There's the central snack bar, and there's Davis's. That's, that's the guy who, who started off with an off license. And, Ran a prosperous business here for, for many years, he and his, his successors. But yeah, it's all a bit uh, dreary up there now. Um, St. Ebbs was a great place to, to grow up as a child, I think. There seemed to be all sorts of opportunities, especially during the Second World War, where some GI had parked his Jeep uh, somewhere in St. Ebbs, and all the local children uh, piled on piled onto it. Hopefully not with uh, disastrous consequences. And then uh, in 1956, this is a, a photograph to illustrate um, children playing in the street, in, in, in one of the, the streets in St. Helens that was due for the chop. This was taken in conjunction with a sociological study of St. Helens, comparing it with Barton. And it's fascinating reading. Um, because the people in St. Ebbs living in pretty poor conditions, you know, some of them with no electric light, uh, the tin bath, you know, going to the Greyfriars public baths for a sixpenny bath if you can afford to. Um, but they, most of them actually liked their houses, um, although they were condemned. And the guy from the Oxford Mail going around said most of them take such pride in their houses, you know, the gardens are nicely looked after. And these were properties which, you know, were to go at any, any time now. So, very interesting. In fact, there were more critical people from Barton <laughs> than there were from St. Ed's, which is, is bizarre. But on the other hand, there were other voices heard in Barton saying, it's like heaven compared to where we were. So, you can never trust this sort of testimony too much, I suppose. So there was always plenty to, to do playing on the street, but um, from quite early on, uh, surprisingly, uh, the city got interested in providing some sort of recreational facility for St. Ebbs. And that, the initial one, was St. Ebbs Bathing Place, um, opened in 1846 and provided with a little bridge from Blackfriars Road. Um, you might think this was just to enable the children to have a fun time, but in fact, as much as I guess there was some of that about it, but the main impetus was the amount of nude bathing that was going on in the, in the, in the river. So a lot of people complained they didn't want to see any more naked men and boys. So that was part of it. And then there was a slightly more humane fact that a lot of boys were dying, drowning in the river, so they thought they ought to do something about it. Uh, providing safer uh, swimming facilities. So that was it. That was Oxford City's first recreational facility provided by the ratepayers. It cost about a tenner. <laughs> <laughs> um, later on, about I think in 1900, um, they leased from Christchurch the rest of this island, as it still was, as a playground for the children to, to enable them to play in a, in a tiny piece of, of 
green space. But all the area above that we now think of as Oxpence Meadow, that was all out of bounds. That was all Christchurch uh, meadow land and we didn't go there. Um, I should mention, or I haven't got pictures, other facilities that were available. Both Holy Trinity Church, which was in the very heartland of St. Ebbs, and St. Ebbs Church, um, had a lot of social uh, activities for members of the congregation. Um, but there was also, from the 1900s, Balliol Boys Club, uh, which operated initially from Littlegate Street, a property roughly where that, some of the new Pembroke College housing is. And later on in the century, after the First World War, uh, a new building was built at Blackfriars Road in memory, I think, of Keith Ray, who died in the, in the Great War. Um, and that, that survived until the 1970s. And for many of the boys of St. Ebbs, that was the, you know, the place where they had all sorts of opportunities, even sort of foreign travel, I think, latterly. Um, but many more, much more fun than they would have got elsewhere. Moving on then to improvement and clearance. Um, I've mentioned the importance of, of main drainage. I mean, clearly that was crucial uh, to stop just filling the place up with, with sewage and, 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 um, and, and polluted water. Um, interestingly, there were earlier efforts to alleviate the situation. Um, the ditch between Blackfriars Road and Friars Street had been filled up in the 1840s. In the 1860s, um, the paving commissioners made what I think is a regrettable decision of, of culverting uh, the Trill Mill Stream. Rather than sorting out the sewage, they just thought, oh, just hide it under here. <laughs> and so the Trill Mill Stream disappeared. So this lovely name to what must have been a lovely stream is just lost. And, and even as we speak, uh, there is a sort of ingenious concrete culvert being built to take this poor stream uh, around the new underground car park. To <laughs> sacrilege! Because uh, if, you, if you go down to Holly Bridge, you see this lovely little stream sort of coming out behind the head of the river and think, see, that's good look like this. But it doesn't. Um, so, what happened was that from the 1860s, um, you get a sanitary authority called the Oxford Local Board. Uh, which appoints a medical officer of health and they appoint a sanitary inspector and gradually the staff of these departments uh, get to grips with what's going on in not just St. Ems but all over the city and some of it is in terms of trying to force owners of property to, to do them up. Um, this is Waterloo <coughs> Buildings um, off, off Blackfriars Road in, in 1914 um, so there was a lot of effort put into sending out notices and threatening owners with, with JPs and closing orders and so on. And some properties were demolished like this um, as a result of those sort of uh, activities. Um, they also got involved in 1890 <coughs> in putting in, by which time we were into uh, the County Borough Council, um, they decided that Blackfriars Road and Friars Street would be a lot healthier if there was a bit more space around them. So you get put in um, a linking street here um, between Friars Street and Blackfriars Road, um, <coughs> which also managed to destroy a rather scruffy square here with, with four, no fewer than 14 houses in it. And you'll see on the extreme right of the image there, um, Holy Trinity Church, which had been built down there in the 1840s to um, cater for the burgeoning population of St. Ebbs, which by the 1880s had reached over 5,000 in this tiny, uh, tiny part of Oxford. Mm. Mm. Sorry, Martin, what was that new street called? It's just, it was just added to Trinity Street. This gives you a rather grim impression of, of, of St. Ebbs in the 30s. Uh, this is a lady called Daisy Russell with her two daughters, a tin bath hanging up at the back there. And it's a reminder of, of you know, how difficult conditions were there. Um, in 1899, the sanitary inspector 
had visited eight, 949 houses in St. Ebbs and found 59 pumps still in use producing water from the ground. And the owners were, were told to uh, put on proper water supply. Um, health visitors begin to uh, visit uh, mothers with, with babies in 1905. And, and by 1909, they're recording visiting 135 St. Ed's babies to try and reduce the incidences of infant mortality. Um, in 1919, uh, the rectors of both St. Ebbs and St. Albates petition the uh, medical officer of health to do something about the unhealthiness of the area and requesting him to inspect it. Um, A.L. Ormrod was the, the MOH at the time. He tells the chairman of the housing committee that one could include practically the whole parish in, in a clearance area in order to um, satisfy the, the petitioners. Um, by 1930, um, they're reporting that they're instituting a program of, of trying to ensure that every household has got a separate WC and water supply. No mean feat in an area so, so crowded. Um, the, eight, the 1930 Housing Act introduces the concept of, of slum clearance in a, in a much bigger way than it existed before. And during that decade, the city um, declares a hundred slum clearance areas across the city. Um, some of the most beautiful uh, houses in Headington, Cowley, Fulvico were amongst these, these slum clearance areas. But there were eight clearance areas in, in St. Ebbs affecting 82 houses. And then finally, because St. Ebbs was getting beyond them, uh, in 1938 they declared the whole area a redevelopment area. Um, comprising 642 <coughs> premises, um, most of which were, were inhabited. Of course, the war then comes and uh, nothing happens for some time. And then in 1948, um, you get Thomas Sharp's um, plan of uh, the city, and for replanning the city. Uh, this was his idea of, of dealing with. St. Ed's, and you've got um, St. Aldate's running up there, and then the whole area sort of transformed uh, with, with sort of great office blocks and, and roads and, and uh, apartments. So, obviously, nothing comes to much of that. And then in 1955, uh, the city comes up with another scheme, which is really quite interesting in, in, in the sense you wish that had happened. So, this was before some of the road schemes get involved too much. So you have Oxpence Road just drifting off up Friar Street into a new road which then heads down towards what was going to be the Meadow Road across Christchurch Meadow. But that leaves a lot of space down in the southwest corner of St. Ebbs for um, new apartments and flats and even a smart new primary school uh, down by the recreation ground fire station where the ice ring is. So nothing came of that. And then in uh, 1958, the city produces this wonderful model of what they want in phase one of, of the development. And you begin to recognize things that did actually happen. Um, these are the mesonettes in phase one. An 11 story block of flats was envisaged here, um, which at least we might have Roger Dudman way, but at least we don't have that. And then other things which never came about. One of the issues with St. Ebbs was sort of paralysis because of road schemes. And although phase one got built, anyone who's been along 10th Street will realise how close it comes to the, the flats at this far corner. And that was because when they designed them, they thought the road was going to be a lot further north. And then, you know, things changed. So this is the brave new world of um, Prior's Wharf and, and Preacher's Lane, the Maisonettes built between 1960 and 1962. Mm -hmm. And at last, you know, years after they promised it, um, some new housing being provided in St. Ebbs, still dominated by the gas holders for a few more years. And then there are all sorts of other schemes in the 1960s. This is one by the architect 
Geoffrey Beard, um, which Castle Street is under there somewhere. <laughs> and then the castle, the prison was about to close all through this period, so he planned another tower block on the site of part of the castle and, and other buildings. This, I think, was going to be a market, and uh, then we've got St. Ebb Street and there. Bond Square, of course, has completely vanished. And then the Oxford Preservation Trust couldn't resist getting in on the act in 1960 um, with a scheme which actually did preserve more than, than most schemes. They wanted to retain the west side of, of, of Paradise Square, uh, which fortunately they thought was Georgian, although it actually quite isn't. No one needed to know that. Um, and they wanted to preserve um, Balliol Boys Club, um, which is really nice. And of course they wanted to preserve the houses in, in uh, what was still Charles Street and Holy Trinity House, which they eventually succeeded in doing. Um, they didn't want the tower block, and they wanted sort of lower housing. And it is quite a, a, a civilised scheme providing lots of sort of uh, pleasant public space around the, the, the end, edge of the area. The road schemes were quite dreadful, I have to say, but then everyone's road schemes were, were dreadful at the time. And then there was a private individual called Gilbert Howes, an architect, who with his wife bought one of the houses, which are now owned by the Preservation Trust in the 1950s. He did it up with the aid of an improvement grant from the city, and was then, a few years later, told they were going to knock him down. And so he was somewhat annoyed, annoyed about this. And so he came up with this scheme of his own for how it could exist with, with the new proposals. These look suspiciously like the, the latest scheme for Westgate, actually, <laughs> um, which is going to dominate again in the end of, uh, of uh, Turner Game Lane. But anyway, he, he moved on and his scheme perished. But um, in the late 1960s, the fate of these Charles Street houses, as they then were, um, became more appreciated, really. I think there'd been a complete lack of interest in, in much of St. Helps. You know, it was just regarded as you know, outdated, outworn, and the sooner we get rid of it, the better. Um, but at last, with, with um, these houses, there was a sort of course celeb, uh, and uh, you see here, I trust, yes, James Stevens Curl, uh, the architect, still writing away, um, leading a party from the new, then quite recently formed Oxford Civic Society to raise awareness of the disgrace that the, the city had mm -hmm. voted to demolish these listed buildings uh, in, in late 1970. Um, fortunately, um, the demolition was, was, was uh, reversed and the Preservation Trust stepped in uh, to save the buildings and, and they're still looking good today. And even the, the far end of the street has, has recently been improved by um, the Pembroke College development at the end of Bloombit. Um, I didn't mention, of course, that where this nasty pole is, um, there was a continuing block um, which was demolished in 1968 because the city felt that it might fall on, on men who were installing a sewer um, to, to the new Westgate. So we lost two of the houses, um, sadly, for no very good reason, I suspect. Which brings me on to um, the extraordinary fact that so much was destroyed with so little comment, really. This was the, the west side um, of, of Paradise Square, I guess the bit that the Trust was interested in preserving back in, in 1960. Um, Jane, uh, well actually I am old enough to remember all this in there, but I didn't actually come here till virtually all of it had gone. Um, but I do remember this bit and being absolutely disgusted, disgusted of Oxford. But this had happened and it was too late, you know, everything, everything was going. Um, so it was really only in the 60s that people began to appreciate these buildings for their sort of quality. Um, but having said that, a lot of the people who were living there already appreciated them. They might have lacked 
what we would think of now as basic facilities. But all they actually needed was to have those facilities installed. But of course, that was never an option. So, uh, you know, I, I guess because there was the sort of prospect that they would get better accommodation somewhere else, most of the tenants probably just thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. Um, most of St. Ebbs was owned by small people, I think, not by, uh, I don't mean physically small, but small uh, property owners. And I think one of the struggles with the area throughout its history was their reluctance to, uh, to, to undertake necessary repairs. No doubt rents were incredibly low, they weren't making much money, so they probably didn't cut up that rough about uh, the demolition of the area. Uh, and as I've said, there wasn't the sort of um, professional protesting going on that, 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 that uh, happened later. <coughs> but there were people, particularly in Paradise Square, who, who just couldn't understand the, uh, the, the, the wrecking of an area which was so nice. And, and there was a guy, um, F.W. Lee at number 15, who encouraged nearly 70 residents in 1960 to petition the council for creating their a memorial of devastation and squalor, which I think is a really nice. I, mean, I nearly used that as the tape as, as the title for the talk. I thought it sounded slightly depressing. So this was the sad um, fate of, of Paradise Square. That's the last house uh, going in 1972. And this is the last house in St. Ed's, uh, going in 1978. I actually got in there, and it was a lovely house. It had a really super upper room, you know, absolutely quite charming, potentially. Um, but, you know, sadly, it all just went. Um, and once it had gone, or once the area was going, you got this sort of huge... Um, burgeoning of, of nostalgia really and, and for about 10 years there were Friars reunions if anyone here went to them but Alderman Fred Ingram came to speak at one of them he described the destruction of St. Ebbs as a residential area as the biggest mistake Oxford ever made we should never have allowed that to be destroyed all that we have got now is a city centre with nobody living in it and yellow lines everywhere. <laughs> so that, you know, that, I'm afraid, um, was that. I just, have I got time to just whiz through a few? I just wanted to try and bring things up to date because my first memories of, of St. Harris was masses of, masses of sort of wasteland and, and car parks. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful when in 1977, um, I think it was Architects Design Partnership came up with this scheme for the southwest corner of, of St. Ebbs, which interestingly was intended to cross the river, um, but uh, that land was so polluted that it was only suitable for students, apparently. <laughs> so, uh, so the Sir Geoffrey Arthur building of Pembroke was the only thing that was built over there. But you've got, at last, some sort of semblance of... of uh, <coughs> community. And, and these were three ladies returned to one of the council houses that were built in, in, in Thames Street uh, in 1980. Um, just in case anyone remembers them, um, they were Vi, Vi Keen, uh, Edith Edwards and Peggy Walker, um, all of whom had been housed away from, from St. Ebbs and they could, you know, they were so delighted to be back. One of them said, I'm over the moon, I can hear the trains going on. It's a wonderful uh, nostalgia. And then the, the very much younger Bob Price here, <laughs> as chairman of the housing committee, uh, presenting a lady, another um, ex Friars resident, uh, with the key to her council house in Turner Game Lane. This was an area that had been designed for a market and the Crown Court. But by the 1980s, you know, the Crown Court had found somewhere else and the market was staying where it was. Um, so the council filled that little gap. And Bob Price talks in his speech about um, you know, rebuilding the St. Ed's community. So that was quite an important little corner. I just wanted to finish with um, some comparisons because 
the whole, you know, as I said earlier, we've, we're reduced to needing archaeologists to, to find out about a 19th century suburb, which is bad, isn't it? Um, because the, the street plan has just been completely butchered. Um, so we're now looking from Trinity Street, the, 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 19, the 1890 edition, uh, down towards Holy Trinity Church and then into the gas works. So that's how it was in about 1910. That's virtually the same site today. Um, this is the 1890 bit. That's Blackfriars Road, so the church was there. And now you continue down to what I think the, the Pembroke students call Colditz, isn't it? The, <laughs> on the other side. And then uh, an example, you'll recognise, I think, the building on the extreme right is, is the Paradise House or Castle Tavern, I think it is now. And we're looking into Church Street. And then you look at the majesty oh, of the oh. Westgate frontage. Um, I'm not convinced it's actually going to look too much better than its new form, but uh, that's it. And I'd like to finish with just one image of, of how things are changing. Um, just one quote from Peter Rowbottom, who was Deputy City Architect in 1985. When it is all filled up again, St. Ebbs will not be like any of the plans. It will be a little bit here and there, like all of them. A carefully built record of the indecisiveness, the changes of heart, the short spurts of certainty that are the hallmark of town building in our 20th century democracy. Um, his words still ring true 30 years on as we witness the building of the new Westgate and luxury apartments which are going to neighbour Mr Bricknell's meadow which we saw at the beginning of the uh, talk. Thank you very much. sort of paradise garden next to their religious house yeah. and I guess it was their sort of the nearest they could make to paradise on this side of the, of the divine I guess. And, yeah, it was just a, a beautiful place to, to refresh and yeah. create and it sort of it, the name carries on through to paradise square and paradise street. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm, um I heard you say the comments from Councillor Ingram's about the whole destruction of St. Ed's being a ghastly mistake. Uh, I have heard this is the reason why the council never went ahead in Jericho yes. and did the same thing. Is that correct? I think, yeah, I think the, the trouble is that the whole business of knocking down St. Ed's went back so long that right. you know, it was an unstoppable process really. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, Maybe the fact that the, the, they were all so busy plotting how to destroy St. Debs sort of delayed them. <laughs> and, and it was it was the early 60s before the public health inspectors were sort of targeted at Jericho. Yeah. yeah. And by that time, things were changing. Yes. And, and the planners were changing as well. Right. And, and yeah, I've read an account by Reg Crossley, I don't know if anyone remembers him, he was an inspector down at 
old rectory in, in St. Um and he, he said that they went there and that the public health people and the planners sort of agreed amongst themselves that selective rehabilitation was the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were prompted by you know, people like Olive Gibbs, um, the local church, I think there were, the, Jericho had a lot more yeah. defenders, yeah. You know, somehow St. Herb's that than the people to sort of stand up and, yeah. and, and you know. That's really nice. Mm. Um, Rocky, you, just, you mentioned looking into your chapel yes. in Wall Street, what, and that still exists? That still works. It's, it's, it's attached it? to the Deaf Centre. Oh, I see. Yeah. So it's part of that Yeah, it's part of that whole building. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, what other questions? Yeah. 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 Reverend Stansfeld from St. Ebbs, was he contemporary with Ormerod? Yes, he was contemporary, yeah. and he was the director of St. Ebbs who, who sent this um, petition. Um, he was enormously concerned about the sort of health of the patch. Um, it was on his initiative that the Greyfriars baths were set up, um, and he got sort of allotments for the nobles. And, and, you know, he was enormously active, um, but battling against. <laughs> An awful lot of obstruction. I can remember when the first um, multi-storey and surface car park was excavated in, at the end of St. Ebbs. Um, it revealed the old culverted drill mill screen. I haven't been able to spot it since <laughs> they've renewed the car Well, they're having to... They're having to reroute it all around this amazing underground car park. Um, so it's sort of a really heavy engineering. Yeah. We're dealing with something which, you know, if you think of Amsterdam or something, people would actually yeah. like having water go running through yeah. there. But we're not going to have that pleasure. Yeah. I mean, it would have problems because, you know, Rose Place <coughs> is actually the film on the street. So a lot of people would use access to, to buildings. Presumably, it won't be a brick. Like the no, it's a great big concrete <laughs> monstrosity. <laughs> you won't see it, but it certainly won't be like it when it appears in the Memorial Garden of Christchurch. Or, you know, sad. <coughs> Did um, St. Ebbs solidly remain the place of landlords? There was a very little movement into home occupation. But I, okay. I don't think there was. I mean, I'm not. I, not got the evidence yeah. from the rain box only, but yeah. I imagine it was mostly... And in comparison with Jericho, if Jericho <coughs> was more owner-occupied, could that explain why there, there was more protest or people had a stronger voice? Um, Maybe. I'm not sure that there would have been that much owner-occupation in Jericho, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. I think Jericho was just... It was lucky in that you know, all the effort was... Yes. was was, work, was destroying this bit, and, and so they were delayed, and they, and they had, you know, much more defence. Yeah. Well, I think earlier on they <coughs> had the, the luck that, yeah. you know, all their sewage was polluting Worcester College Lake, um, so you know there was somebody who was actually interested in yeah. that sewage, um, whereas you know St. Ed's it was just going into the city water supply, so it didn't matter. I mean, just as an example, my grandmother lived in St. Thomas's which she owned for 40 years or 50 years, number 10 New Street, which yeah. she always rented out. And then when it was knocked down, um, you know, it was um, compulsory yeah. purchase, and that was the end of the story. Yeah, I think there, there must have been a lot of that. I think um, St. Debs was like a sort of wonderful investment opportunity mm -hmm. for people who didn't have a lot of money. When, yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that that made for problems in that they didn't have money to keep the properties up no. and the rents were low because of they were kept up and you know it was a sort of vicious circle. You know. yeah. 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 Yeah.
about uh, the excavation at the Westgate. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Sunday. Sunday. Is it a Sunday? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's a Sunday. Um, uh, we have uh, Ben Ford here, the project manager for Oxford Archaeology. Ben, I don't know whether you are able to give us an update on how things are going on there. Well, we're just about to um, yeah, we're just hello, mm -hmm. uh, we're just about to basically start a program of large excavation work. Um, for about the next five or six months. Mm. And um, we're going to have two big open days, one to coincide with the Festival of Archaeology and one to coincide with the Heritage Ocean Board. So um, look out in the press for those. And we're going to have a pop-up museum in um, Westgate Shopping Mall in the old Claire's Accessories. I know you all used to yeah. shop there. Yeah. Um, so it's down on the left by, by, by the lift that so takes yeah. you up into yeah. the language schools. Um, so we're, we're just about to set that up. Um, so it should be up and running kind of mid June. And we'll have a day a week, probably a Wednesday, I hope, where we do a show and tell. But it's also going to be a space that other um, volunteer groups and groups that over tea can do stuff within shopping centre and we'll have that until I think the end of August and then they <coughs> strip it out and then it all gets demolished up to a certain point. So they're keeping the straight bit of the mall and a bit after that gets knocked down but I think the same thing is trying to stay put. <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be quite rowdy um, shopping in the uh, freezer section. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Um, yeah, that's about it. So, so yeah, lots, lots of stuff coming up and lots of involvement for the public. And then, uh, well, I'll be doing a talk on, at some point, I don't know the date yet, but um, what we found so far, so an, an update. Yeah, and, and I have seen the trill, the trill mill 